past or in the future? I can't figure. Am I in the past or future? <laughs> because it's because it's eight it's eight p.m. here, and it's the morning of some other day for you, right? It's uh. It's uh, sorry. I was like, what is he talking about? I, I'm very much in the presence, brother. <laughs> I'm nine a.m. on Monday morning. If that helps. Oh, okay. So you're in the past. So so uh, are you in the uh, Australia? Where are you? I am in Bangkok. I, oh, am, I know. Okay. I'm a COVID refugee here in Bangkok. <laughs> no worries. No worries. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been to Australia a few times. I, I'm that side of the world. All my friends, because I get up super early on the East Coast of the United States. And uh, and so the only people awake are the Aussies and people in your side of the world. <laughs> I like, good eye, Mike. How you doing? So. Yeah, I am still awake, barely. This yeah. is always the thing because it's Asia. So it's either early in the morning or evening yeah. time. And I always get to pick, am I not awake yet or am I already kind of on the way out? But Right. Well, I get up super early uh, East Coast time. It's like one or two o'clock in the morning. I'm awake. That's just I naturally get up and then I get a lot of my work done. So this is actually oh. late in the day for me in my work oh. schedule about midday so i start to slow down and then go to bed about seven o'clock and then i'm up That's at one, two in the morning I just, and then i get efficient sleep when i do sleep i wear the aura ring so i can track it and yeah funky hours but it lets me talk to wonderful people at different times of the day so i'm glad we are doing this today guys that's jake steiner uh found out about the great work he's doing on eyesight because when people talk about health, and I've been health podcasting for almost 17 years, people always think diet and heart disease, diabetes management, obesity, but they don't think about other things like eye health. And so that's kind of something you stumbled upon. You, you're not anything in the nutritional health or health world at all. Uh, what did your guy say? You're a uh, semi-retired stock trader and investor. So let's start there. How did you get interested in this subject of eye health? So, uh, vanity, the short answer is I was single, um, early 20s, and I was wearing minus five optic glasses, really thick glasses. And the stronger your glasses are, the, the smaller everything looks behind them. So I had these yeah. little tiny beady piggy eyes that I was blinking out from behind. And uh, one day I went to the optometrist and he said, you need stronger glasses. And I said, how is that possible? And he said, it's your genetics suck. And... Is that true, by the way? Is it that is not. Genetics? It, it can't be. It can't be. It, 50 years ago, you know, most of the population didn't need glasses. 100 years ago, nobody needed glasses. It's not, our, our genes didn't spontaneously, collectively change. Our habits did. Yes. So. Well, and a lot of the eyesight issues are related to some of the diseases I just talked about. Uh, diabetes, uh, anything like blood sugar and insulin. And we'll get into some of that stuff in a minute to see what your research has found. But um, so you had uh, a lot of eyesight issues. So what kind of started you on the journey? Was it frustration with the, I guess, the optometrist and ophthalmologist that you were going to? They were just saying, well, you just got to keep getting thicker and thicker Coke bottle glasses. Tell us the journey. Yeah, no, they said there's no fix and they said it's genetic and I'm like, genetic doesn't sound right. This was, fun fact, this was so long ago, uh, there was no Google Scholar, one of my favorite ever yeah. web destinations. So all of the research I did was in physical libraries. And it turns out that all the stuff we talk about, it sounds like a wacky conspiracy because on one hand, there's a hundred billion dollar a year industry that tells you you're genetically flawed and you need glasses and they make thousands of percent markup. And on the other hand, is this weirdo, right, with, without any degree who says that you don't need any of those things. So it's definitely one of those things. Google Scholar is amazing. And it's really, really, really easy to find out that what causes nearsightedness that you need glasses to see clearly at a distance and how it can't be genetic and to a large extent how you can prevent all of this stuff from happening. So that's what I did. I went to a library. The answer is immediately apparent. It's There's something called uh, near-induced transient myopia or pseudomyopia, which means there's a circular muscle in your eye that focuses the lens. And whenever you look at something up close, that lens is, that, that muscle is tight. And 
you keep that muscle tight for hours and hours and hours, which is not really intended to do, eventually it just spasms. It just gets stuck. It's called pseudomyopia. And that is the muscle keeps your eye in close-up mode. You don't have bad eyesight. Your eye is not getting worse. It's just stuck in close-up mode. That's all it is. And then you go to the optometrist. The optometrist doesn't tell you this, which if you go to scholar.google.com, you're going to get tens of thousands of peer-reviewed clinical search results talking about pseudomyopia. And instead, they give you glasses, which circumvent that spasm. Spasm's still there. The glasses just move the light back further in your eye. They have the side effect that your eyeball elongates, which they also don't tell you. But then next year, they get to sell you stronger glasses. And the year after, they get to sell you stronger glasses. Nobody questions it. I didn't question it till I was in my early 20s. And then you just end up in this place where you're a, a different person than you're meant to be because you look at the world through this round or square little piece of glass and you become more cautious, you move more carefully, you have to look at the ground when you're walking, you yeah. communicate with people different because your your head is stuck in this in this forward position. It just it's a whole thing that I'm fascinated isn't a bigger topic. Hearing you talk about kind of how the doctors gave you an inevitability of what they thought was going to happen. The genetic and there's really nothing you can do about it. It sounds very familiar to a lot of the people I've interviewed here talking about diabetes. It's just going to get progressively worse. There's nothing you can do about it. No amount of diet and lifestyle change is going to help. Da, 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 da. And it just it, it's amazing to me when you have real life examples like yourself with eyesight, like other people when it comes to managing their A1C for diabetes, it's bullshit. Like these doctors telling you, it's just not true. And yet how many people just blindly, all pun intended, trust these doctors that what they're saying is completely vetted out and it's not proven at all by the science? And it's a uh, fun fact, my parents are both medical doctors. Um, so I grew up in a household with two doctors and it gave me an insight into how much this is a personal matter because my mom doesn't like pills of any kind. She doesn't, yeah. didn't, she doesn't allow frozen foods. She doesn't prescribe anything to anyone unless it's a complete emergency. And my dad's the complete opposite. He loves pills as a solution for everything. And it really taught me that it's, you go to a quote unquote doctor you're still meeting a person and their preconceived yeah. ideas and their preferences yeah. and their ideas. You know, it's not fact. It's a guy's interpretation of whatever yeah. he remembers. And the fun part about medical people that I try to teach my followers and listeners is uh, they're just a consultant in your health. So if they're consulting you about your eye health, your diabetes, whatever you're dealing with, they're a consultant. They're not running the company, which is your body. You on that. You're the CEO and owner for life of the body. And so when you go to a consultant in a business, you're not giving them control of the business. You're saying, tell me how I can make it better. So you're taking the advice they give you. Now, you got some bad advice from the consultants in your eye health. Other people get bad advice with the consultants in their metabolic health. And, and But people abdicate that responsibility to take control of ownership of their body. Okay, doctor, just tell me what to do. Oh, you want me to put on glasses that look like Hillary Clinton circa early 90s? Okay, that's what I'm going to do. And people do that. I'm sorry, Hillary. Uh, people do that. Like they just obediently listen. And you grew up with two medical doctors. You know, like there's the white coat syndrome. Um, and people just, just want to be told. Um, which is unfortunate. I think we all have a brain for a reason. We all have uh, cognitive thinking skills for a reason. We just need to use them. Yeah. And there's a level of intimidation involved there that I've found, you know, because an eye exam, okay, if you go to an ophthalmologist, not an optometrist, not a guy who works in a shopping mall selling lenses, but an actual MD, proper ophthalmologist, get an annual eye checkup by all means. I'm not against it. Checking your nearsightedness, you can get a measuring tape and do that at home. It's all just how far can you see before there's blur, right? And 100 centimeters divided by however far you can see before there's blur equals the diopter correction of your glasses. You could literally measure this at home and you can buy your glasses for 10, 15, 20 bucks online. And that's it. It's a simple process. You can buy over-the-counter pain medication that can kill you. Yeah. But then 
clear curve pieces of plastic are called prescriptions because right. of millions of dollars in lobbying. And they call you a patient to make you feel powerless. And it's a whole, I think, it, it's a really questionable practice, especially when it comes to eyesight and this whole thing. Right? That is something I never thought about before, how the language has conditioned us to play roles in this. So, oh, well, you have a problem that needs a prescription. You don't need a prescription. You're a patient. You're not a patient. It just, that that's fascinating, Jake. I never really thought of that before, and that has application across every aspect of health. So, uh, interesting analysis there. So, you now run this website, uh, uh, endmyopia.org. So, go check that out, you guys. And uh, you do YouTube, you got a popular Facebook group, a forum, uh, Wikipedia page. You, you're out there and you've been out there doing this a while. What's it been like educating? I assume your target is patients, um, but is it the medical profession as well, the people, or is it just the end, end person that's frustrated by the failure of the medical system? So no patients, no patients, because your eyes are not sick or ill or broken. There's literally no, there is no medical condition. I right. I keep waiting for the counter argument there because it's it's right. a perfectly healthy eye doing what it's supposed to be doing. So let and, me let me reframe the people that deal with this issue. That's your end target, right? Right, right, yeah. Um, tw almost twenty years now, and it started out as just being ignored and then slowly it kind of became a little fringe thing and then it started catching on and I got a lot of hate. There were some bad years in there. Um, but okay. we were too small to be taken seriously but big enough to where we caught the attention of optometrists who, uh, they went on a limb. I mean, I definitely had there were lawsuit threats, there were threats in general, there were a lot of, there was times where it wasn't that great. Now we're big enough to where for any individual practitioners you know, like just even our Facebook group alone is like 20 some odd thousand members. Like our website had yeah. 1.2 or so million regular visitors last year. So now they've they've gone away for the most part. And now it's slowly, slowly becoming like a an increasing bit of curiosity. Well, we, so. we've seen the same thing in my category. I talk about ketogenic diets and it was the same thing. Like when we were small ball, they were coming at us hard. And I've been at this for 16, 17 years. So back then it was really bad. Oh my God, you're going to clog people's arteries. and da, da, da. But now the research has uh, come along and supported a lot of the things that people like me and others have taught about. And now there's mainstream acceptance of keto as a popular kind of way to lose weight, but it's more than that. Um, and so I, that's cool to see that at first you were getting some of those arrows. What was the pushback? initially about the work that you were promoting what were they saying it was amazing i was unbelievable because they literally said that that i'm wrong in what i'm saying the causes are of nearsightedness and i'm quoting their peer-reviewed medical journals like yeah. ophthalmology and optim i'm quoting their research right because there's academia which figured all this out and then there's what i call retail optometry the people that sell you glasses yeah. who just said this is not true, you know, and I'm literally just going, I'm quoting your stuff. But, and then it turned into just, because a line, right? That stuff is on, well, not unquestionable, but as the science is pretty good on that. Me then saying you can reverse it is a, a valid debate, right? Because there isn't enough science. There are tens of thousands of anecdotes of people who have done it, yes. con confirmed by the optometrist, but it still is, I'm I'm willing to accept somebody going, you're out there, right? I'm like, but it's it's better than the guys who say nothing can be done. We don't want to hear it. You know, I'm like, let's work towards better ideas. Like, let's I'll accept that I don't have the title, but we're seeing a lot of people reducing their dependence on these things, and we should be open minded, maybe in in helping people. Well, and they always say you have no evidence. I'm like, look, it may not. Be peer-reviewed scientific evidence, but anecdotal when it's replicated, in your case, tens of thousands of times with all these people, that's evidence whether you want to like it or not, like it or not. Um, and even like some of the things they did in the world of ketogenic research was, well, the the researchers are being, uh, the research is being paid by industry. I'm like, what research is not being paid by industry except the ones NIH funds? 
And so that's one. And then they're like, oh, you got you got uh, published in a smaller journal that's not as <laughs> as the Journal of the American Medical Association or the American Society of Clinical Nutrition. But, you know, the big boys, what's the big boy in the ophthalmology group? Oh, I don't know. There's a there's several that are pretty big. The problem is I, I have given up on because I have hired two guys that were writing a study for me. And then as we're getting closer into the process, I'm finding number one is that people already count arguing it, but just, it just becomes a debate. It's not the people that care about their eyesight. It's the people that care about the debate. And I'm not trying to convince those people because they'll never be convinced because they do exactly what you say. They find another study and then they go, here you go. Right. I'm trying to get the people that are stuck behind these things to look at ideas, right? Like to look at what's out there, look at what other people have tried, look at why this is not particularly dangerous or risky to play with and then have an open mind and have a biohacking kind of experiment. Yeah. Those are the people I'm interested in. Yes. Yeah. Biohacking thing has caught on the last few years. you got people like Dave Asprey and Ben Greenfield and I, I dabble in it. There's a lot of people out there really promoting it for a variety of reasons, mostly brain health, just general health. But I'm not seeing a lot of people talk about biohacking in the context of eye health. And so I'm glad to hear that you're kind of leading that charge. Um, What are some of the things, biohacks, that people are using to try to improve eyesight? It's really easy to do. That's the thing. Like it's generally the interest level isn't that high because there's a quick fix available, right? Like keto will have a measurable impact on your well-being and reduce pain and fix all kinds of potential issues where eyesight, you pop in contact lenses, you're good. So in general, there isn't the really a strong motivation unless you're into sports, unless you need it for your job, your pilot, or unless you just don't like to be dependent on things. A lot of people are like, yeah, whatever. But fixing your eyes is shockingly simple. I mean, the, the, the main point of fixing eyes were weaker glasses, slightly yeah. weaker glasses, just a little <laughs> bit. So let your eye do the job because your eye has a built-in mechanism to readjust itself. So if you introduce a tiny bit of blur, not to where you can't see and drive and recognize people, just a little bit, three or four months that blur is gone. And then you reduce them a little bit again. So Jake, would that be because it's producing kind of a hormetic effect? It's a stressor on the body, but a good stressor that then the body goes, okay, we can correct that. It's a, the eyeball is this fluid filled ball of, of tissue. So it's never perfect, right? Just it can't be because it's a, it has to be perfectly shaped. The light comes in through the front of the eye, through the lens, focuses on the retina and the back of the eye. So there's this ball, fluid-filled, and it's never perfect. So it has a built-in mechanism to continue to always readjust itself all the time. Like So what it does is it, it takes the light that hits the retina and goes, is the light perfectly focused on the retina? And when you wear slightly weaker glasses, you have some of that light not focusing perfectly, but a little bit in the front of the retina, just a little bit. And that's enough for that mechanism in the eye to go, ah, I'm too long. So is the assumption. We don't know this. There's not enough scientific evidence, a study that, the mechanism, absolutely. But that that we don't have 200 people that wore weaker glasses for five years and we have before and after axial length measurements. But the strong assumption is that it's this mechanism that's most likely responsible for why is it that after three or four months that I'm wearing slightly weaker glasses, my vision is perfect again, right? The other possible explanations certainly, but that's our most likely working theory. And I've, I've dealt with people who measured the axial length before and after and seen a reduction, but there's still enough debate where I'm like, I'm not putting my name on that as a certainty, but it appears it's that mechanism that works. Have you guys tried the Paleo Valley beef sticks? These beef sticks are 100% grass-fed and grass-finished, and many of the grass-fed beef sticks on the market today are actually finished with grains. They use beef sourced from small domestic farms in the United States. They only use real organic spices to flavor the beef sticks versus all the conventional spices sprayed with pesticides and other natural flavors from GMO. They also ferment the sticks, which creates naturally occurring probiotics all great for your gut health and best of all they taste amazing again they're paleo valley my favorite beef stick on the market today go check them out you guys paleovalley.com use the coupon code jimmy at checkout for 15 percent off your first order 
Paleo Valley Beef Sticks. And that sounds amazing. And I wonder, have you done any research into the role of like hormone control uh, in conjunction with the weaker glasses to really speed up that process. I know anecdotally a lot of people that listen to my podcast and follow my work, they go keto and it lowers their blood sugar and insulin levels. And it seems that that has a positive effect on eyesight, that people that were wearing glasses, getting worse and worse every year, getting more expensive prescriptions every year with the 3,000% markup, like you were talking about, just keep doing that. And then suddenly they go keto and they're like, wait, my eyesight didn't get worse this year. What happened? And that's not even using the weak glasses part yet. That's just nutrition changing them hormonally. So if you looked at any of the research that kind of combines that weaker glasses theory with like getting hormones normalized? I I always say the body's a system. We have this weird, a lot of people still have this weird idea that things are separate. Like your eyes are separate from how you, you the rest of you functions, your diet is separate from all, all connected. If you have an insulin spike, your eyesight will be worse. If you start measuring your eyesight, you can really measure how far you can see before blur starts. You have a pizza and drink a big bottle of Coke, which your audience probably doesn't. But if you do, you're likely to be able to measure your eyesight having gotten worse during that insulin spike. Just as an example. So connected system, you know. So what's going on there? Talk about what that is. When the insulin spikes and you start to get the blurry vision, what is that? I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the, the the thing is, I am, there's so much to this topic that, that falls out of my range yes. of expertise. I'm, my only focus has ever been, I was wearing minus five doctor glasses. I want to get rid of them. And eventually I figured it out. And then over the years, more and more people joined and more and more people tried stuff. And we refined a way, just an approach, just if you want to get rid of those things, here's how you do it. And the longer I've been doing it, almost 20 years now in a forum people are having these in-depth discussions about things that you're talking about hormone changes where i'm like that is a whole nother planet you know of of stuff that i don't have the bandwidth to deal with just because my day is already right like welcome to my world brother welcome to my world (laughs) because when i'm not embarrassed i mean i am i'm i'm not embarrassed to admit that there's lots of things that i don't know right like there's just i love don't have Staying focused on what you know, and you're not trying to go outside that scope. I talk about keto, and it's got little ancillary things here and there. But then somebody goes into some medical condition that, and I'm like, uh, I'm I'm out. I don't have a medical degree. <laughs> and and even like nutrition in general, like there's, I've had great conversations with people that are heavily into nutrition that have degrees in the stuff. They know so much stuff. I'm like, I respect that, and I will hand that part of the conversation over to you because it's. It's its own field, right? I'm fascinated. And when these things come up and you can have vitamin deficiencies and mineral yeah. deficiencies that affect your eyesight, yeah. absolutely. You know, where I say get a blood panel and make sure if there's deficiencies, address those. Oh my gosh. They're probably not only affecting your eyesight, they're affecting, you know, all the bits. Vitamin E, vitamin D, vit- I mean, there's so many we could go down the list that directly impact your eyesight. So I love that you acknowledge the hormonal effect, the nutritional effect, the nutrient deficiency effects, because all of it matters, you guys. Like if you're working on your eyesight, it's not just a physical exercise uh, that you do using the weaker glasses. It's a totality of a lot of different things. What's something surprising you've come across in your research that you're like, whoa, I didn't know that would have an effect, but it's had a profound effect on eyesight? Lighting. Lighting is huge. Yes. Lighting is huge. As I- Bright light in my eyes uh, while we're doing this. Yo, work. wow. That is a setup. That yes, is a setup, setup. brother. Um, yeah, fluorescent lights, narrow spectrum lighting, just yeah. a lot of artificial lights. And again, measurable impact. Like you can measure the distance, how far you can see before this blur. When you sit in a naturally lit room or in a shade outside, it's going to be noticeably better. Yeah than weird artificial light and fluorescent is terrible. You might be sitting in a bright environment and still be just blinking at stuff, not seeing clearly. Cause just something about that light spectrum, something about the the, the way that, that light affects your eyes, noticeably worse eyesight. And the more you the more time you spend in that, the worse your vision apparently tends to be. Crap. 
I'm doing four podcasts a week in front of these lights. So are you telling me I'm it's out? fine. That's fine. I'm saying all day. You know what I mean? Like if so, you work in the shopping mall and never see the daylight, that kind of now, thing. We yes, yes. And I have been in office settings where I'm under fluorescent lights all day with no windows. And, ugh, so I get yeah. it. So uh, let's talk about the sun. So the sun could have some really profound healing properties to eye health, ostensibly because you're getting the vitamin D from the synthesis on the skin, ostensibly because you're getting calmer and I guess a, a less stressed state could probably impact in a positive way your eyesight. Have you seen anything regarding sun exposure? I, that I also falls into, again, in one of those categories that are ancillary or related and have suspicions. Um, we get so much less UV exposure than we should. You know yes. what I mean? Like you're behind a glass, even and you sit in your car, there's no UV, right? Like all the, the glass around you is filtering out all the UV. So right. much less exposure. I see curious, potentially coincidental things where people that have more natural light exposure seem to improve their eyesight faster. Yeah. But again, it's one of those topics that could become its own field. Right. And I was like, that's interesting. But I don't even know how to engage that enough to give you a, a quantitative analysis cool. of how the UV light affects your eye. See, here's the thing I love about podcasts and what we're doing here today. We're throwing out kind of theories about things that could be beneficial. The science isn't keeping up with all the theories. And so there's a lot of theories that just need proper funding, but there's not like no eyeglass company is going to pay for this. NIH has no interest in this. It's 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 very difficult when you're trying to fight a system of funding, unless you have some philanthropists that deal with myopia and, and want to do something productive for the world. It's just not going to get the funding. How How is the funding, by the way, in your field? The funding in my field is uh, my pocket. That's the for, funding. For, for There's a, so, <laughs> yeah, for my stuff. But there was no conversation about myopia prevention for a very long time. Um, there was no, pro and I've always said, I've always been a little cynical. I've said, wait, they're finding something that can be patented and sold at a significant profit. The conversation will come. Yes. And in the last several years, they've been developing products that do what I was talking about, the, the eyeball length adjustment. Yeah. And your eyeball grows longer when you wear minus glasses that give you clear distance vision, but they focus a little bit of the light, light behind the retina. Makes your eyeball grow longer, makes your nearsightedness worse. And now, this has been known, right? And I've been told that I'm crazy, but it's been in the clinical science. Yeah. Now they're developing contact lenses that have little rings in them that they refocus some of the light in front of the retina for myopia prevention. And now all of a sudden they're citing the same stuff that I've been talking about forever because now there's a there's a patented product that you can, you're can you going to spend thousands of dollars on that they sell to your kids to prevent myopia. The same thing would happen you just wear weaker glasses, but that makes no money, right? So they needed a product first, and now they're like, oh, we have a thing. Yeah, I've got two examples of that in my field. So in the late 60s, Dr. Richard Bernstein uh, was a medical doctor with type 1 diabetes, and he was trying to create an at-home being able to test your blood sugar. So he created uh, a glucometer. So, But when he came out with it, everybody's, oh, my God, that's horrible. That's not gonna... And now, look, glucometers are so readily available because finally the big companies could make money off of it selling their own version. So that's one. Then with keto, I think part of the thing that helped it become popular was you had people that said, I can get you into ketosis without you having to cut your carbs and manipulate your food. We're just going to have you drink these exogenous sources of ketones. And so they started selling them and people getting in into ketosis. And then that got people, oh, we can make money off that. So now keto, 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 keto. Whereas if you talk about ketogenic diet, oh, that's going to kill you and so it is amazing that good old free market capitalism rules the world. And and I can't fault it. You know what I mean? Like I'm not against – it's just like everybody knows McDonald's is bad for you to still eat it. My problem isn't the, the fact that we have this quick fix. My problem is that you're being lied about the options. Yes. People are still going to buy glasses. People are still going to eat at McDonald's. But don't tell me that it's genetic. Just be like if you were to spend less time in front of screens playing all the time and you went outside – and didn't wear stronger glasses, then you could revert. And then I said, I don't want to know. Just give me the contact lenses. I'd be cool with that. It's the lie part. Yes. You know?
Well, capitalism is fine. That uh, yes, I love capitalism as well. I've done very well for myself being an entrepreneur. I get it, but I do think that people could benefit from like what you're sharing on your website. Again, guys, I'm going to go ahead and give the website again so I can look you up. Endmyopia.org. That's e n d m y o p i a dot o r g. Uh, and definitely go follow the Facebook group. Uh, is it just in myopia over there? Is that how you find it? Yeah, just uh, on top of the website, there's a resources link with all the different stuff. Yeah. yeah. So so you mentioned the weaker glasses. Uh, talk about the at home, how you can measure what your vision is, how you can determine to get the weaker. You don't want to go too weak, but you want to be just weak enough that it's a little blurry, but not so blurry. So talk about some of how people do that at home. It's super interesting, by the way. If, you, if you're curious about this, the way to get into it is just buy a measuring tape. We also have an app. The, the app can measure from the from the camera how far your face is from it. Oh, it does wow. the same thing. It's not great because it's developed by my wallet and I don't have <laughs> the kind of budget that. What's the app called? Uh, it's called Measure and uh, M E O W S U R E. It's also on the website. Just just okay. the link is there. And basically, the front facing camera of your phone yes. s- knows how far you're away and it shows you the distance and you can change the measurement from centimeters to inches to nice <laughs> to uh, to the opters. So you can get a direct output of how strong your glasses have to be. And the way it works, and the optometrist does the same thing conceptually, is hold a book in front of your eyes where you can see it perfectly clearly and then slowly move the back. Yeah, that one, for example, that's a good book to try. <laughs> and I don't know. So you move it back a little bit further till the text becomes the tiniest bit blurry just changes yeah. in any way and then you measure the distance from your from your eye socket to the wow. text that's the degree of your myopia wow. 100 divided by the distance is the power of your glasses right so if you can see 50 centimeters 100 divided by 50 is two so your glasses would have to be two diopters to have perfect distance vision right it if you're not into math, like I'm, anybody says any math, I'm already confused. But it's so simple: 50 centimeters, two diopters, and yeah. then you hop on Zenny and you buy yourself some two diopter glasses. You have perfect vision. You get some minus 1.75. It's not perfect anymore, but it's still really close. And then, and then you start comparing. I'm sitting in a in a room with natural light. I see perfectly fine. It's dark, and I've been binging Netflix for four hours. I can't see that well at all. And you start relating to your eyesight more naturally than overcorrected, super powerful glasses all the time. You always have perfect vision. It's like being on drugs that make you feel no pain. You know what I mean? Like it's 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 eliminating your your feedback from your body going, hey, this wasn't great for me. That four hour Netflix thing, not super great. Because you keep throwing on those super strong glasses and you just can't tell. Well, and there's the thing, like once you start healing this and you wear the weaker glasses for the few months, um, it, by, by the way, before I get into my next thought, if you do that for a few months and you get improvement, do you then go down a little more and do it all over again for another few months? Or do you have a washout period to try to let your eyesight get used to this being normal? How, how does that work? So the devil is in the details. Like the level of discussion we're having right now is like me saying, if you lift weights, you're going to get stronger, right? Like yeah. it's accurate, but there's, a f- if you really want to get into it, there's a fair amount more detail that you probably want to explore before you go buy any glasses. It's, yeah. it's super worth to spend, say, pretend it's a little course, right? And you spend a few weeks just immersing yourself because you're literally talking about retuning your vision. Yes. Uh, I don't recommend you just go right now, buy yourself some weaker glasses. It's the, it's the premise. It's the principle you are going to want to mess around with more stuff. Like, for example, if you spend all day in front of screens, super bad for your eye to wear glasses meant for distance vision while you're just looking at a screen. So you would get weaker glasses just for all that screen use. It eliminates so much eye strain. Like, it's so much better for you to say, glasses just for this distance is all I need. So, but I don't want to turn this into a hostage situation where it's a three-hour podcast. So I'm just giving you the the basic highlights, but it's, it's that idea. They can go to your website if they want to learn more and get all, all, all geeky. I will tell you, uh, it was about maybe 10 years ago. I'm 49. So about, I was just about to turn 40 and I went to see a doctor cause I was starting to have a trouble seeing 
far. So what's that nearsighted, right? And so I was, I went and he's, he did all the normal, the optometrist, those ophthalmologists did all the normal everything. And, oh, you need glasses. And so I got into glasses, $250 later, you know, all the things. Do you know how much those cost wholesale? I have all the wholesale price sheets for all the, all the brands. Like the most expensive ones. Well, there's some that are over $10, but you have to get real crazy. Keto Chow is a customizable shake mix that is also perfect for cooking and baking, giving you simple, nutritionally perfect meal options. Keto Chow. Make keto easy. Discover your favorite flavor at JimmyLovesKetoChow.com. So I, I bought the $250 glasses and got the little yellow tint and some nice frame. All. I think the frame is kind of the, the – that's how they sell people. Oh, you're going to look good and chic in your frame. I'm going to just buy the frames with clear and you're good. Uh, but anyway, um, put them on, and I was getting massive headaches, and I was just not feeling well. I could feel like the physiological effects of that. I'm like, wait a minute. I, this might be helping my eyesight, but I feel shitty. Like what's happening here? I ended up throwing them away. I just or stopped wearing them, and they just sat in my drawer forever. And I eventually threw them away. I never could deal with glasses. It was too much. I wonder if they did too strong of a prescription. Which I guess, in hindsight, now thank you. I'm glad because I don't wear glasses. I'm 49. I see really well for 49. A lot of people start to see vision decline. Um, but that was an interesting experience. So. Why did the headaches happen? Have you done any kind of research into that or what? too strong is the is the most common thing. What they usually do is they put you in a dark room, not everybody, but commonly. So in 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 low ambient lighting, your pupils are are dilated. There's a bunch of stuff that goes on that basically your vision isn't amazing. And then the chart is lit with one little light. So you're like worst case scenario. Like they're not putting you in a, a naturally lit ambient nice room. Um, with a nice quality printed chart a lot of the times. So worst case scenario. And then they don't tell you what they're putting in front of your eyes. They keep making it stronger and they say this way or this way, this way, this way. And they keep dialing it up until you no longer notice a difference. Yes. So you're literally like that thing is tightened all the way. And now when you walk outside into a nice, bright, normal day oh. and you put those things on, you're Rude. your brain, your visual cortex is like something is not right about yes. this. It's like it's freaking out because all of the things that it normally would see, uh, if you go back to the optometrist, the optometrist say you will get used to it. Right. So Jake, and uh, you would, you would, you know. So Jake, when people go weaker with their glasses, are there any kind of physiological effects like headaches and things that way, or what? What happens? What What are some of the common things? that you felt, number one, or some of the people in the tens of thousands of people as part of your group that they've reported? If you if you notice any side effects, you overdid it. The point of this whole thing is the eyeball is such a finely tuned mechanism that tiny inputs are all you need. Yeah, it, A headache is like you already are way outside of the boundaries. It should just be you don't even notice except... Okay. You're sitting in your in a dark living room and you're reading subtitles on a screen and they're not as clear as usual. Like that's right. the level, like just a little tweak. Super common, incredibly common is people the first time around just overdo it. Like your first time to the gym and you're trying to run 10 miles, it's not going to work out, right? Like little oh, tweaks. Yeah. Now you tell me. I tried to run 10 miles the other day, the first time and it just, oh no. Uh, <laughs> Why? People throw away their glasses. There's all this crazy internet stuff, which is why I think it's fair for people to question this and it's fair for people to do their research because there is that kind of talk out there like Bates Method, all kinds of stuff where they're like, you have to throw away your glasses and your eyes will fix themselves. Maybe, but on the way there, you're not going to have a great time because you won't recognize any of your friends and you're going to seem really weird and you'll have headaches and I mean, it's like your mom when, when you were kids. I don't really like medication. Stay with it. So it's kind of the same principle. Well, you know, I don't really like having to do things like wearing glasses. So the body will heal itself. And I do think the body has a miraculous way of healing itself. But then there's things like the weaker glasses that can precipitate some of that healing. Yeah. And you don't need to do it the hard way. Right. Like I am the kind of person I don't like to do things the hard way. My advice is always chill route is fine. 
So why is it what you're teaching uh, through your work more commonly known? I know you're going to say there's profit to be made, and, and you kind of alluded to that right away in this conversation. But surely, like you're doing your part, like, do you feel like your voice is being heard well enough that people that want access to your information have access to it and they still choose to go have glasses? So be it. Like, what, what do you think your impact has been? I have been laying low more or less like if, if people look at the website there's a lot of rants and inside jokes and it's a very kind of relaxed community and we're not trying to appeal to the lowest common denominator because yeah it's not like i'm jealous of your keto thing honestly it's you are safe you know what i mean like there's plenty of people talking about it it's it's accepted conversation i'm in a space where it's a hundred billion dollar year industry yeah and that's it I don't want to be the first guy to talk too loudly, you know. There, okay, I won't mention the the network, but a very large network offered to do an hour documentary, and they hounded me for almost a year about it, about this topic, and I said no, every time because the first guy never makes it. You know what I mean? Like the first guy that goes up against the the established dogma right. is not going to do well. So I'm just staying on the fringes. You and I are having a chat. The website exists. People find it. People talk. But I'm not trying to be heard too loudly. That's so interesting to me because I'm going against two big industries with the pharmaceutical companies not liking that I'm getting people to come off their diabetes and heart heart disease medications and obesity medications and procedures and da da da. That's one. And then the second industry that's also big is big food, all the crappy garbage, as I call it, the junk food, fast food. Like, so I, I, I know about taking on industries. And in fact, when I wrote this book, like it was the first one to start talking about keto. Nobody else had talked about it. And then this became a big book in keto because I was willing to step out. I think you're selling yourself short. I get what you I have, I have again, lower, I do, I'm, I, my day job. My my day job is investing in stuff, and I have lawyers. Like I've on staff lawyers, who who every quarterly review mention this and suggest that I don't do it. Wow. Um, and I've they make reports about it and the potential fallout and everything else. And it's just you're a braver man than I, or maybe <laughs> I just have the lawyers, you well, know, forty page thing that says all the ways they're gonna murder me, not literally but yeah. otherwise so i'm like well, you know I, I call myself the the last living holy i guru of course in jest and there's so much joking in there and asides to not have this taken too seriously because i yeah. just don't have the i want people to find things and have ideas but i'm not brave enough to go shoot at me you know well well and i don't know that I, i'm brave either it's just this is what i do i have a passion for it you obviously have a passion for what you do but my personality is when I have a passion, I have to tell the whole world. But you have a job outside. This is my job. So outside of this, there's really nothing. So I have nothing to lose to talk about it. Whereas you do have a job and you've been very successful as a, as a stock trader and investor. So I, mad respect that you're willing to do this as a side passion to the thing that makes you money. Um, but I just, I have a feeling this could take off. I wish you had taken up that big network to do the one hour documentary, but I, your position. No way. No way. It's a hundred billion dollar industry. They just tie me up in lawsuits and I'll never be heard from again. My idea is if it takes 20 years, it takes 20 years, but enough other people start talking about it where I'm no longer synonymous with the movement. Yes. You know what I mean? Like there's 10 other guys, they, they're not going to take big shots at me because it, the, the cat's out of the bag. And we're still kind of at a point where that momentum is very slowly building. And as more people talk about it, I'll feel more comfortable. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe today, you being on my podcast, people watching and listening to you, they'll get inspired and say, I'll take those arrows. Let's go. Like, I, I changed my eyesight. I did this. I, I did uh, Jake Steiner's plan. And let's go. Like, I'll, I'll take it on. That's great. And And I love that you're kind of embracing the behind the scenes guy the one that kind of inspires someone that may be that voice. Um, and when I came on the scene in 2005 was when I first started uh, blogging and podcasting, nobody was talking about low carb diets in a positive way, ketogenic diets in a positive way. And I just started chirp, 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 chirp. And then it got other people to start chirp, 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 chirp. And now we're a bunch of chirps out here 
making a lot of noise and at least it's known and it's not not known in just a negative light it, it is still known in a negative light but a lot of positive too and i think the same could happen for you jake i'm really happy you shared your story here today jake Snyder, you guys go check him out over at endmyopia.org and uh, check him out on youtube facebook he's got a forum lots of great work that you're doing and i'm so glad you were willing to share with my audience here today Thanks for having me, Jimmy. I really appreciate it. Hey guys, you know I'm all about healthy nutrition and I have a brand new product I want to tell you about called Athletic Greens. This is not just a multivitamin. It has 75 essential elements that you want to have in your diet from probiotics to greens to digestive enzymes to prebiotics. There's so many things that they pack into the Athletic Greens. The main reason why I love them is it puts it all in one place. Like literally you'd have to uh, a la carte buy all of these different supplements and they do it all in one package. So if you go to athleticgreens.com slash Jimmy uh, and you can get a special discount if you go there and the discount is you get a free one year supply of their vitamin D, as well as uh, some of their travel packs. Go check it out, you guys, athleticgreens.com slash Jimmy.